Can't answer the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut country. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside you the bony transfer! Your Honor, you doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider Not yourself in contempt! You. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You them. want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Those are two great actors right there. Has anybody ever seen that movie? Some of you have? It's, uh, it's pretty old, actually, by now. Well, you can't handle the truth. And you can't handle the truth. And you, and you, and you, and you. And I can't handle the truth that we are totally, completely, unconditionally loved by a God who is sh not dead, he's surely alive, and he absolutely loves us into existence. That is the truth that we largely can't handle, because if we did believe that, if we did believe that truth, our lives, my life, would look a whole lot different. That's what we're going to talk about today in this morning's session. God that he is alive and that he is our father. Now, some of you, I, I know that there are a lot of people here at a different place. Uh, some of you might not believe in God. You know, that's just where you are and, and that's okay. Some of you maybe just don't know or you've never had an experience of God. So we have everybody here at a, a very at different places. And uh, I want everybody though to draw into this reality of this inner need that we all have for love, right? We all have it. And I want to ask you, you know, where does that come from, this need that we all have for love? Well, in the Bible, in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says that God made man in his image and likeness. Okay, so that's first. God made man in his image and in the divine image, he created them male and female. So if you believe in God, if you believe in the Bible, the, that means that no matter if you're black, white, brown, short, tall, rich, poor, you are made in the image and likeness of God. And then in 1 John 4.16, don't put this up there yet, Jeffrey. It says, God is what? God is blank. Love. Everybody aware of all these scriptures? God is love. It, it doesn't say that, that God loves because surely God loves. It says that God is love. It's just the very fabric of who he is. It's his nature. God is love. And so if we think about that, we are made in the image and likeness of God, and God is love love, and then maybe that, ha that is the reason that we all have this incredible need to be loved, every one of us. There is a, uh, a, an interesting that ha thing that happened after World War II. There were a lot of orphan babies, of course, because of all of the death and violence. And there was a group that sent a group of orphans to New York City, and there was another group of orphans was sent to Mexico City to be cared for, babies. And so after a few months, this, the, this, the people who organized this, they wanted to see how the babies were doing. And they were shocked to find out that the mortality rate, the rate at which the babies were dying, was much higher in New York City than it was in Mexico City. Because in New York City, they had all the technology they had the most sterile environment. They had a larger staff. But over in, in Mexico City, they didn't have as large of a staff, as sterile of an environment. Um, they didn't have the technology for sure. And so they wanted to understand, you know, what's going on? 
And when they went and observed the, the two locations, they saw that in New York City, the babies were only really held and touched when they were fed or when they needed medical treatment. But in Mexico City, they, they saw that the babies were picked up and held just all throughout the day. They were played with, they were nurtured, and they were sung to. And so at the end of all of this, the only thing that they could conclude is that love made all the difference. Love made all the difference and actually loved these babies. It, it gave them life. It loved them into existence. And so we all need love and have an incredible need for love. And babies come into the world and they're the purest form of love. You know, they come in with a need to be loved and nurtured and cared for. And where does that first come from for babies? We, babies look to their parents for love. They have an expectation that they will be loved and nurtured and played with and cared for by their parents. And really, for little kids, their, their parents are the center of their universe. And I, I have five kids, and uh, my two older ones are in middle school, so, I mean, they still, we, they still like me, but I'm not quite the center of the universe. But when they're younger, kids, parents are the center of their kids' universe. My daddy's the strongest. My mommy's the most beautiful. Now, my youngest, I have um, Caroline. She's four. My, my youngest daughter, Caroline. Jeffrey, go ahead and put that up on the screen. This is a picture of my little daughter, Caroline. And uh, she's... Oh, isn't that so sweet? So here's Caroline out grocery shopping with mommy, and I am just absolutely all the time showered with, Daddy, I love you. You're the best. And she just she is full, just a bundle of gushing love and, mm, oh, just love her. Mm. And then I have my son Gabe, and he's seven, and he's not far behind. He is just a... Uh, um, really expressive. They're both very expressive and very affectionate. And they pretty much think that, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty cool in my kid's eyes. Here's a little video of Caroline just one day doing her thing, making up a song about how awesome I am. Oh, no audio. <laughs> Okay, I got cut off, but that's her. She makes up songs. My daddy, he's the best daddy ever. I mean, this is my existence, and I love it. And you know what? You guys are the same way towards your parents as little children. And uh, it's amazing. Of what parents say or they don't say makes all the difference in the world. And, uh, and what they don't say, you know, it's so overwhelming to know the times that I react out of anger in, in, a, in the wrong way and see these little people looking up at me in these crocodile tears, you know, just the incredible influence that parents have on their children to love them well. And so, you know, I think God's original tent in the beginning when he created Adam and Eve in the garden was he, he loved them. He showered them with his love and affirmation. And the original plan that was that Adam and Eve would receive the love of the Father, and then they would pass it on from one generation to the next. But, of course, we all know that's not how it happened. It's not how the story goes. Man chose independence and said, you know what? We want to do this on our own. And so God, in his love, let man and woman go. And so the result of walking away from God, the result of turning from him, that separation came something that we know as pain, rejection, and suffering. That's our experience. You know, we don't perfectly receive love from our parents. They're, we receive, their, our parents are imperfect. And this isn't about blaming parents because parents ultimately, your parents were little children who weren't perfectly loved at, at some point in their life. And so what happens though is when we grow up and we our parents don't love us perfectly, we go looking for love in other places. A famous quote by St. Augustine is that 
Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. That there's a restlessness that comes from our, our desire for love, but it only finds its fulfillment in God. Or there's another way of saying it, that, there, that it's like we have a God-shaped hole, each one of us. There's a hole inside of us, a restlessness. We're looking, we're searching for love. But that God-shaped hole can only be filled by one thing, and that's God. But we are restless, and we look for love in all the wrong places. You know, what are some of the ways that we look to fill that God-shaped hole, that we look when we are feeling restless? Well, a lot of people, they, they look to fill that God-shaped hole. They look for love in performance, to be the best student, the best athlete, the best dancer, whatever it is, success is where they find their meaning. And it's, it's okay to really be into sports or really be into good grades out of a love for being a of sport or a love of wanting to do your best. But I'm talking about some people who are there is just a drive, an insatiable drive to be successful that comes from a deeper place of looking for acceptance and looking for love. But the problem with that is, I mean, look at all the, the stars and athletes that have it all only to be cra only to crash and burn because that those things don't satisfy us truly. They don't fill up that God-shaped hole. Or maybe some of us think we can find love. We're restless and we think we can find love in relationships, right? Our music, I remember last Sunday we had a 242 night where Elizabeth was using some examples from Taylor Swift songs and just the idea that we have to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend to, you know, we have just that right person and then we'll be loved. But looks, the divorce rate's over 50%. And it's not that marriage can't be, a, marriage is meant to be a beautiful thing and it is. But another person, even in marriage, doesn't fill that God-shaped hole, doesn't satisfy that deep longing and restlessness that we have. Or maybe another thing that people turn to in their pain, in their looking for love and acceptance, is addictions. You know, to drugs and alcohol and pornography. It's a way of numbing the, and, and um, filling that, that restlessness and that longing and looking for something to make us feel just right. So we put those things in that God-shaped hole. Um, we had a night a few weeks ago on marijuana and talked about how prevalent marijuana is with young people as an escape, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. And maybe you, you don't connect with any of those things, you know, that, that I mentioned. Any struggle that we have with sin ultimately is a failure to really understand that we are loved into existence by God and he has a plan for our life. I was a part, a part of a college Bible study that my wife and I have in a young adult group. And we, there's a series, this is the young adult group, on Thursday about the sin of envy, of how we envy other people and sometimes we feel better when we see other people fail. And I was really convicted about areas in my life where I can be envious or rejoice when other people, it's like it makes me feel a little better about myself if somebody else doesn't do as good. And it's like if we truly believe we're loved into existence, that God created us just the way we are for a mission, then we wouldn't struggle with envy or hatred or pride or lust. All sin comes from ultimately a failure to really trust in God's love for us. So when it all boils down to, it, it, it's all about love. Like you think about 9-11 when you, you guys weren't really old enough to, or any major catastrophe, and they interview people like on the planes as they're going down. They're trying to get a hold of their loved ones just to get them on the phone to just say, I just wanted to tell you I love you. Because when it all comes down to it, what is life all about is love. Being loved and, and loving others. And I think the problem with our struggle is that 
when we think about our restless, restlessness, our need for love is we're looking for love on a natural plane. We're trying to put these things into us that don't fit the God-shaped hole in each one of us. And that love is a supernatural love, and only a supernatural love can fill that part of us, can satisfy the restlessness and the desire for love that we all have. And we believe that love comes from God. One of the most famous scripture verses is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's like, that's the story of the gospels. That's the story of the Bible is that God the Father so loved the world and Jesus is saying that he sent me to tell you how much he loves you. That's the good news of the gospel. God the Father sending Jesus and Jesus saying, my Father loves you. He's not angry with you. He's not disappointed with you. He, he loves you. And he wants, my daddy wants to be your daddy. In Galatians 4, it says, as proof that you are children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. So God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is a word that comes from a word that means daddy. So Jesus is coming to say, God loves you. He wants to be your, your daddy. Like God isn't just out there, you know, above, distant from us. He wants us to come to know him as his, his daddy. So I think the, the one thing I wanna encourage you guys this weekend is just to give your permission to be very little, to be a little boy or a little girl who just needs a dad, who just needs to be loved. And our parents I, all fall short. Some of you guys come from homes where you've been loved very well by your parents, but even there, they're not perfect. God leaves a certain amount of parenting undone so that we will look for God who wants to be our perfect father. And some of you, I wanna just speak a word of hope to who maybe have extremely absent fathers, or maybe you don't know your fathers at all, or maybe you have a father who has really hurt you in, in some ways. And in, to you, I just wanna say that, um, you know, one of my favorite scripture verses is, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Where things are the most messed up and seem hopeless, God wants to pour out an extra abundance of grace and, and just flood that, you know? He makes up for it. His grace is sufficient. And so if you are in that type of situation, I don't want this to be, oh, well, my father, really, and I'm really messed up. No, because God the Father wants, especially this weekend, you to begin to know that he's not dead, he's surely alive, and he wants to love you as a child. He wants to be your daddy. There's a great story of a, um, a father and a son in Armenia, a country near Russia over in that part of the world, and there was a great earthquake, I think in 1988. It was maybe 8.5 on the Richter scale, so it was a big earthquake, I think like 30,000 people died. Well, the morning of that earthquake, the father took his son to school, the local elementary school, and he took his son to school. And usually the, the father is not able to make it back after work in time to pick him up. But on this day, the father said, Daddy, promise me, promise me you'll come back to get me. And the father said, okay. I'm gonna be, I promise you, Armand, I will come back to get you. And 
So the father goes to work in the factory, and about halfway through the day, the, the ground begins to shake. And the, he goes out outside of the building, and he can see there's damage. He sees all his, his co-workers around, and nobody's injured. But he surveys the town, and he can see there's serious destruction. So, of course, the first thought he has is towards his son. And so he takes off across town, and he just runs across town. And he comes up to the elementary school that his, his son was in, and it is now a pile of rubble. And there are parents lined up outside, just wailing at, at what has happened. And so the, the father, he looks around, and he surveys the area, and he can see the part of the school where he knew that his son's classroom was. And so he climbs, and he climbs up over the rubble and gets in this pile, and he just starts to remove this rubble one piece at a time. And the parents are like, what are you doing? They're all dead. And he just ignores them and removes the rubble, keeps moving it one piece at a time. Finally, the, the policemen and the firemen can come. And they say, sir, it's dangerous. You have to come down. But he just ignores them. And he continues to remove the rubble one piece at a time. Six hours go by. 12 hours go by. 18 hours go by. 24 hours go by. And his hands are bloody from the, the metal and the, the concrete. And he's hungry and he's tired, but he just keeps on going. At 36 hours, when it seems that all hope was lost, he removes a piece of rubble and there's a little cavern. He can see a hole, a pit. And he puts his hands over his mouth and he yells out, Armand, Armand. And he hears this little voice from inside, he yelled out, Daddy! And he said, Daddy, we're, we're here. We're, we're hungry. Some of us are, are, are hurt, but the, the, the walls collapsed around us. And the father said, give me your hand, Armand. Come on. And he said, Armand said, okay, Daddy, but I want to help my friends out first because I told my friends, don't worry. My daddy's coming back to get me. And sometimes in our world today, young people, there, all hope seems lost. There is a lot of rubble that we seem to be piled underneath. And there's a lot of challenge and temptation and sin and problems in our families. And today, our God is coming for you. He wants to draw near to you today. Your daddy wants to draw near to you. And we encourage you to this day to draw near to him, to let him be your daddy, to just receive his love, just to open up your heart, to let him dance over you, and to allow yourself to begin to be amazed by him. Our God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside. He is a father. He is your daddy, and he loves you. Let us just take a moment and just pray this prayer. I encourage you to close your eyes as our music ministry sings this truth about God dancing over us and loving us of being amazed by us and allow him to open our hearts so that we can, re in response, be amazed by him. Lord, I'm amazed by you.
We sing this simple chorus. We don't need any lyrics. I invite everybody to close your eyes. Everyone close your eyes. And open up your hands. And just allow yourself to be a little child. Allow yourself to be open. Allow your daddy to love you. Receive that love. 